Okay, we'll continue uh, from where we stopped just before the break. Uh, we read verses uh, 3 to 5 of chapter 6. And, um, you know, even as Paul is drawing um, close to the end of this letter, which is he is right, he's written to Timothy, you know, he's, Paul is referring uh, to something that he's already mentioned at the beginning of this letter that is in the first chapter. And he's telling Timothy that, Timothy, you need to be uh, on guard against those who misuse the word of God. Okay, so he's coming back to that theme and he says, you know, uh, those who teach otherwise. So in this context is basically meaning those who are replacing the truth in God's word or replacing the plain teaching of God's word uh, with the focus on prophecies and visions and strange spiritual experiences that people claim. He says, you know, there's a great danger uh, and people are doing this, so Paul is warning Timothy against this. And then he says, also be careful about those who do not consent to wholesome words. So Paul warned Timothy against those who left the word of God, you know, uh, to promote their own ideas, or those who deviated from the truth in God's word, you know, to promote their own ideas or understanding, their own fables, myths, myths, myths sorry. And he says, uh, those who do not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, you know. Um, so there are different ways that uh, people, you know, do not consent to the truth in God's word. There could be some people who deny God's word. There can be some people who ignore God's word. There could be some people who basically explain God's word uh, in a way that pleases their own uh, understanding or the own life that they are living. And some twist God's word using it basically like a toy to be played with, uh, you know, uh, when they debate or when they're disputing about some things. So he's saying, you know, uh, different people use God's ways in different, uh, God's word in different ways, but do not consent to the ways that you're uh, uh, using, you know, uh, when it's going against the truth of his word. And then he's saying such people are proud, you know, and they know nothing. So here he's basically describing those who are people who misuse God's word. Um, and he's saying, you know, um, they are proud. They don't see or admit to their lack of knowledge. Okay. They're basically talking all of these things because they lack the knowledge. Uh, they lack the understanding to know the truth that is already uh, there. So they basically lack the knowledge. And like most People who are proud, you know, uh, they are able to convince others that they are expert in God's truth. So the way they talk is like, you know, and they justify their actions and they connect their actions to the word of God. They are basically talking as if they are experts in God's word. They know everything in God's word when actually, truthfully and honestly, they're misusing the word. The, the word of God. They're misusing it because they're using the, the truth of God's word to justify their actions, to justify their lifestyle, to justify their thinking, their mindset, their way of living, and to just, you know, appease their own um, selves. And he's saying that, you know, what is the fruit of um, their, their works or their knowledge? He's saying the fruit is disputes and arguments okay so he's saying the fruit of the disputes and arguments of uh, 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 you know of those who misuse God's truth okay so you know and we see that you know when people come in with their own uh, understanding of God's word and try to apply it in for their, uh, to justify their own actions their lifestyles you know they kind of cause uh, a division in the church, strife, 
disunity, disharmony. And he says, you know, it ends up in envy, strife, rivaling, and evil uh, suspicions. Okay. And, you know, the result of all of this is that there is so much damage done to God's people, done to the body of Christ. And so Paul is saying, you know, and he's warning uh, Timothy, you know, from such people withdraw yourself. So we need to withdraw from such people, you know, who are uh, doing such works. And we can, how do we know them? How do we identify them? How? By their fruit, yes. You know, uh, what is their fruit? Dispute and arguments, they'll constantly be dis uh, arguing, disputing with you. They, you can see envy, strife, um, you know, uh, 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 rivaling. Uh, basically, they are rivaling means, you know, they are people who condemn, scorn others, abuse others, and evil uh, suspicions. They're very sub suspicious of uh, others, uh, you know, uh, 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 actions towards them or uh, suspicious, suspicious of other people's move against uh, them. And then he says that, you know, um, uh, in verse 5, he says, useless wrangling of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness, godliness is a means of gain from such withdraw your uh, self. So he says, useless wranglings. Useless wranglings means basically endless and needless discourses. You know? They are talking, talking, this, uh, you know, basically disputing, arguing, discussing. You know, it goes on endlessly and it is needless, it's pointless. There's no need for them to do it. Um, uh, the Greek word actually signifies maddening or angering one another with disputes or, you know, uh, uh, you know, or rubbing against each other, you know, basically uh, ending up in strife. So you're basically angering each other because you're rubbing shoulders against each other, you know. And it's like a scabied sheep, uh, or a scabby sheep, you know, uh, when uh, sh sheep, uh, uh, you know, uh, have in, uh, uh, there's an infection that is there, they rub against each other and immediately they spread this infection. So that is the whole uh, picture of it, the scabby sheep, you know, that uh, rub against each other and hence they spread the infection. So Paul is saying this is how dangerous uh, these people are, you know. Um, so be careful of them and have nothing to do with them, okay. Then he says, who suppose, these such people suppose that godliness is a means of gain, okay. So he's saying not only are there people who are proud, not only can you see in their, the fruit of, uh, their fruit is disputes and arguments to the extent that, you know, they, they spread strife, envy, rivaling and evil suspicious, suspicions, uh, you know, they, use, they uh, have useless wranglings. And also, you know, he's saying another characteristic of such people who misuse God's truth are uh, that their, their interest in the things of God is not to entirely to glorify God, but you know, it is motivated in part by desire for wealth and comfort. Okay, so they are looking for gain, material gain, wealth, you know. So it is not because they want to guard or protect or, you know, shield the glory of God, the nature of God, or who God is. But their motivation, part of their motivation is desire for wealth and comfort, okay. And he says such people think that godliness is a means for making money and he says from such people you stay away, okay. So is it wrong to be, uh, uh, it's wrong, is it wrong for godly people to have money or to make money? What do you all think? Is it wrong for a godly person uh, to make money or have money? No? Okay. What, what do the others think? Any thoughts?
No, okay, thank you, Saratoli. Money can be used as a tool not to be worshipped, yes. Okay, money can be used as a tool to, uh, you mean to build the kingdom of God, to extend and further the kingdom of God, and also to support uh, other people in the kingdom of God, yes. So, you know, what Paul is saying here, that don't use your godliness or your walk of faith as a means to make money for yourself. Okay? Don't do that. Um, and then he's saying, telling Timothy, you know, deliberately, you know, don't associate with those who receive or present the gospel with this kind of marketing approach. Keep away from them. And then he talks about what godliness really is. He says, godliness with contentment is great gain in verses 6 to 10. So can somebody please read uh, chapter 6, verses 6 to 10, please? Thank you, Rosalind. Rosalind says, not wrong, that, uh, that and money can be invested in the expansion of the kingdom of God. Yes. Can somebody please read verses 6 to 10 of chapter 6? Nobody wants to read? Wait. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful laws, which drawn men into destruction and perdiction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith, in their greediness and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Subhashish. Uh, just a minute. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. So it says, now godliness, so Paul is telling Timothy that those who misuse God's word wrongly, they think that godliness is a means of material gain. And um, he's uh, knowing that the statement that he is writing and, you know, that's, that uh, Timothy will read out this uh, to the people at the churches at Ephesus, you know, it can, the statement can be uh, misunderstood. So he follows it up with an explanation. So he says that, you know, godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay. So uh, what does Paul really mean by saying that godliness with contentment is great gain? What is contentment? What is contentment? Uh, I think contentment is when you feel satisfied in what. Okay, con contentment means being satisfied with what you have. Okay. I'm satisfied. You're satisfied with what you have. Okay. Thank you, Subhashish. So he, what does he mean by saying that now godliness with contentment is great gain? What does Paul mean? Any thoughts? So he's basically, yeah, go ahead, Jeffina. Yeah, I'm just sharing my thoughts because uh, in the previous verse, he just talked about people who want to consider godliness as wealth and comfort. So maybe he's just 
trying to explain it much more like when you are when you have the godliness and when you are content you are not using it for the sake of wealth and comfort maybe that's that's the game that is talking okay maybe thank you so he's saying yes you know it's true that godliness is in itself is great Again, you you are blessed by God. You have His protection, your spiritual spiritual covering, spiritual protection. Uh, you receive the blessings of God. All that is great gain. But He says only when it's accompanied with contentment. Okay. And Paul is writing this because he's somebody who knew what is this kind of contentment. Okay. Look at what he says in Philippians chapter four, verses eleven. Uh, to 13. Philippians 4, 11 to 13. Can somebody read that please? Philippians 4, 11 to 13. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. Not that I speak in regard to me, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer meat. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Thank you. So here we see that Paul knew what it is to be content with the, the little or the more that he has. And uh, he says godliness, and hence he's saying godliness with contentment is great gain. Well, it's true that, you know, when you have a lot of wealth or material possessions, you know, uh, uh, they can be a benefit for us, okay? And uh, having wealth and material benefits in itself is not wrong or is not going to you know is cannot does not corrupt us but paul uh, you know uh, is saying that he could abound in material things he could have plenty and still keep those things in proper perspective okay and he says we can only find contentment when our hearts are rooted in godly things our heart is rooted in in eternal things and uh, you know our heart is uh, uh, or our minds are focused on living with an eternal perspective so yes you can have all these material benefits to the blessing uh, you can have you can be prosperous but then you know, you can look at all of these things in the proper perspective. And what is that proper perspective? He's saying, look at it all with an eternal perspective. Okay. Um, uh, so godliness really can bring, uh, you know, uh, unbelievable contentment. But before it can, you know, uh, it should our mind should be renewed our uh, hearts and mind should be in the right perspective you know uh, we must look at material things um, and uh, look at them in the proper context in the proper priority and uh, you know put them next to spiritual things and look at all of them with an eternal perspective okay we can only find contentment when our hearts and our minds are rooted in eternal things, okay? Only when our heart and mind is rooted in eternal things, you know, then we can truly find contentment where even when we have plenty or when we are lacking. Um, and contentment is very, very essential because it shows we are living with an eternal perspective. If we are not satisfied, if we're continually dissatisfied, if you're not happy with what we have or we're constantly being greedy or we want more, it's basically showing us that we're not living with an eternal perspective. If we are living with an eternal perspective, then we will look at all of these things, whether we lack or we have more, we will look at it, uh, you know, in the right context, in the right perspective and the right priority. So, you know, Paul is saying, be grateful for what you have, you know, um, and stop comparing yourself with others, especially in terms of material possessions. Be grateful and thankful for what you have and look at all of that with an eternal perspective. 
how is my wealth and riches going to you know uh, enhance my uh, eternal life okay or uh, you know how is it going to build my eternal life and then he goes on to say a very important truth here for we brought nothing into this world and it's certain we carry nothing out which is very true he's saying don't focus so much on your riches and wealth because today or tomorrow if you die you can't carry that along with you uh, uh, for to eternity but what you do with that money how you use that to build on for your eternity is is what is important okay so he's saying and having food and clothing with these we shall be content okay so he's saying a heart of contentment will be a heart that is humble a heart that can be content with simple things as long as you just satisfy it with the basics food and clothing is basically talking about the basics okay the basic content you be you're content with the basic things that you have that you enjoy in life which means that you know uh, uh, you have a humble heart and you you have a heart of contentment then verses 9 and 10 he says uh, he talks about you know the rich okay so can somebody uh, please read verses 9 and 10 please for us can somebody please read verses 9 and 10 first timothy chapter 6 uh, verses 9 and 10 but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and the snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men uh, in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and perceived themselves through with many sorrows amen thank you jeffina says those who desire to be rich okay um uh, you know, he's basically uh, saying that the desire for riches is is basically far more dangerous than riches themselves. It's okay for you to be rich. It's okay for you to earn and be become rich. But he's saying the desire, the longing, the passion to be rich is more dangerous than the riches themselves. And it isn't only the poor who desire to be rich, but also the rich who want poor. Uh, riches and so he says those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a, a snare okay uh, so the desire for riches tempts our heart away from basically eternal things eternal perspe perspective is eternal riches and it ensnares us or traps us uh, with the things that are earthly that are temporal uh, which have no lasting value and uh, something a snare is something that you can't escape a trap that you can't escape okay so you're always will be dreaming of riches you have but you're not content you want more and more and more and your heart is always set on you know making more or having more okay so he's saying however if our desire is to be rich which means you know you are somebody with no godliness and with contentment then we are setting ourselves up with uh, to fall into temptation to fall into harmful lust harmful desires um, which can lead to our destruction which can lead to your ruin and to your uh, you know eternal damnation or your eternal ruin which is predict prediction uh, is tradition is basically eternal damnation or eternal ruin so here also you are led into uh, destruction here in your earthly life and even in eternity you are going to land up in eternal damnation and ruin so he says the, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil okay so is it wrong for uh, for believers and godly people to make money to earn money to work hard to make money what do you all think no okay but what is he saying here he's saying the love for money the love for money is basically the desire or the greed for riches you know it can birth all kinds of evil and he's saying that it can 
uh, cause us to stray away from the faith. Okay. So making money is not wrong. Uh, working hard to earn more money is not wrong. But you know, desiring the love for money, the greed or desire to become rich can birth all kinds of evil and can also lead us astray from the truth or from the uh, faith. Okay. So that is what he is worried about. And so he's talking about that here. He's reminding Timothy of what he's already mentioned at the beginning of this letter. Any questions, doubts so far? Before we move on to verses 11 to 16. Okay, if there are no questions, no doubts. Uh, can we can somebody please read verses eleven to sixteen, please? But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Thank you, Subhashis. So here Paul says, you know, uh, but you, O oh man of God, so he's telling Timothy, he's commanding Timothy, you need to be different from those who are living just for riches, for material wealth. And he's saying, you know, flee uh, from, you know, uh, those who make proud arguments, those who misuse God's, misuse God's word, you know, and uh, who suppose that, you know, we should follow God. Uh, uh, so that we can, you know, we can get wealth and riches for ourselves, or we can, you know, we should follow God just for what we can get out of it. And he's saying, in this, in the view of this uh, dangers, potential dangers, you know, and how some people abuse the truth, abuse the faith uh, for making personal gains, he's telling, he's admonishing Timothy and telling him to flee, which means uh, run quickly, you know, speedily, be quick to move away, to run away from uh, such kind of things and such kind of people. But instead, he's telling him, what should he pursue? He should pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. So instead of pursuing the desires of the flesh, the, the desires for uh, uh, more riches and wealth, instead of pride, you know, Timothy was to make these things his pursuit, okay? Um, uh, he is to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, um, and gentleness. And these are something that in our own present age, you know, are, uh, you know, kind of overlooked, but are some things that are very valuable to uh, God. So God is reminding us again here uh, today that we need to pursue what is right, we need to pursue godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Okay. And then he says, keep fighting the good fight, you know, um, uh, uh, because you need to keep a grip, you need to keep hold, a firm grip of what is uh, eternal. Okay. That's what he goes on to say in verse 12 fight the good fight, um, you know, uh, going God's way or walking in God's truth or living according to God's standard is going against the flow of the world. Okay, Because the world is running towards pleasures and riches and comfort, whether you make it in the right way or in the wrong way. But he's saying, you know, when you go 
according to God's word, when you're pursuing righteousness and holiness and godliness, you're going against the flow of the world and it's not going to be easy. You know, we know that when we go against the currents or when we go against the flow, it's hard work. Uh, it can be life threatening. So he's telling Timothy, it won't be easy, but Timothy has to have the determination of a soldier. Okay, he's saying, fight the good fight. And says, in the sight of God who gives life to all things. So, uh, you know, Paul has put Timothy in a very difficult place. It's a very difficult battlefield. He's put him right in the front of the battle, forefront of the battle. Um, you know, uh, and it's difficult for Timothy. He is finding it uh, challenging and difficult. But Paul is saying it's good for him to know that, you know, his orders are given from this great God. Okay, And he goes on to talk about the greatness of this God who's called him, who's given him this position, this assignment that he is now in, and who's giving him the orders. And so Timothy, uh, you know, had an obligation. He had to take on these orders. He had to serve the creator who has given him life. Okay, Then verses 13 to 16, you know, Paul uh, basically points Timothy. He's also pointing not only Timothy, but he's also pointing us to the Lord Jesus, uh, who set as an example uh, himself, you know, by not going back on his call purpose and testimony, even when he was brought before Pontius Pilate. Okay. Uh, you know, Jesus holds on to his testimony, even though he knows that he's going to be you know, that was impending upon him. He's going to be crucified, but he does not go back on his call, his purpose and his testimony. He holds it on, even though he's uh, brought before Pontius Pilate. And then, you know, he points, Paul points Timothy to the exalt position, um, exalted position that Christ received as a result of holding on to doing, holding on to God's will, to doing God's will and his plan and purpose. And, uh, you know, what was the end result? You know, he's talking about the eternal perspective here. He's talking about how Jesus Christ was exalted. He had an exalted position and he's going to come as, this, uh, you know, he's returning soon as the king. So in view of all this, he's telling Timothy, you know, all of the challenges and difficulties you're facing now, yes, I understand. It's difficult. But look at what is uh, the eternal perspective. Because Jesus looked at the eternal perspective. Okay? Uh, he went through shame, pain, everything. But he looked at the eternal uh, perspective. And he's saying, hold fast to the confession of your faith. Okay? So we might be in places where it's challenging to live godly lifestyle, to give, to live uh, in righteousness and holiness, uh, to conduct things in a godly and a pure way. But God is, uh, but we need to, even in those challenging situations, look at the eternal perspective. You know that yes, there is a, there is a God who is going to uh, vindicate us, a God who's going to reward us and uh, a place in eternity where we will overcome, we will not have all of these uh, challenges. Now, uh, Paul goes on to basically, uh, you know, talk about or describe uh, who uh, this God is. He says, who is blessed, the only potentate, King of kings, Lord of lords. Uh, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, who no man has seen or can see, to whom be honored and everlasting power. Now, why is Paul using this description in this context? Why do you think Paul is using or describing God in this context? Any thoughts? Why is he praising God and talking about who God is in this context. All of you in class, any thoughts? Or you got tired of listening to my voice? <laughs> I know two hours is like challenging to for you all to continually listen, but thank you for being patient with me. 
why do you think Paul is using this description in this context? Any thoughts? Um, I'll just share my, my thoughts. I'm not sure if I'm right. So when it says in verse 13 that uh, Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pilate. Uh, so I think because he's saying about holding on to the uh, confession that uh, Timothy has made, we also read uh, that Jesus obedience to the point of death. He held on uh, for what he came for. And uh, so maybe that's what he wants to encourage even uh, Timothy to do that you for him to be obedient to what uh, he has confessed uh, to the point of death. I'm just thinking. Okay, thank you, uh, Jeffina. Anyone else likes to share your thoughts? Why is Paul using this description of God in this context? Okay, Paul uh, is telling Timothy, uh, he knows the challenges, the difficulties he's facing in the ministry. But Paul wanted to remind him that God, you know, who he is serving and in whose presence he is, you know, serving and living, is a God who is uh, who gives and sustains life. You know, it's a God who gives and sustains uh, life. So even if Paul, uh, Timothy is being threatened by people, even to the point of where he's going to, uh, you know, lose his life or being killed, just like Jesus when he was before Pontius Pilate, you know, God had the power to either uh, preserve him from death or God had the power to give him the courage to be faithful witness unto death, just like Jesus. You know, uh, God gave him, Jesus, the courage uh, to be faithful uh, witness unto death. So just like uh, uh, like Jesus, okay? So, um, uh, so Jesus, you know, um, rather than seeking to save his life and escaping the situation, you know, uh, by so he uh, uh, he could have done it by softening his witness. He did not do that, um, but he stood and he testified. And of course, we we know the end result of what happened. So he's saying, you know, uh, Timothy, even though you are in the forefront of the battle, understand that. But know the God who's called you, the God who's created you, the God who's positioned you, the God who's appointed you, ordained you for this time and season. And he's a God who's able to give and sustain life. And he's saying that, you know, uh, how long should Timothy hold on to this? He's saying, until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. So this is how long Timothy was supposed to fight the good fight. So Timothy must have asked uh, Paul, how long do you want me to stay here? How long do you want me to continue in the ministry here? I want to come back to you. So Paul is telling Timothy, till the Lord Jesus appears, that is your time for you to fight the good fight. Okay. So that's also for us. How long do we fight the good fight till the Lord Jesus comes back? Or, or before that he calls us home, is still then we fight the good fight. Okay. And then he says, uh, he who is. So he's telling Timothy, you know, who know who this Jesus is. Know who uh, this Jesus is who's called you, who's equipped you. And this will equip you, Timothy, to fight the good uh, fight. And then he goes on to describe uh, uh, Jesus to Timothy. He tells he's the blessed and only potentate. Potentate basically means sovereign, leader, a ruler, uh, the one who alone has all power and strength, who rules the universe. Okay. Uh, so that is the meaning of potentate a sovereign leader and ruler. And we know that he's a king of kings, a lord of lords, uh, needs no description. He alone has immortality, uh, which means there's no beginning or there's no end. He always was, is, will ever be. And he's the only uncreated uh, being uh, who's self-existent and, uh, you know, who's not subject to death. And then he goes on to talk about how this God lives in unapproachable 
light. So he's basically referring to the splendor of God's um, glory, uh, his nature, his characteristics, and uh, especially he's mentioning about his unapproachable holiness. God is so holy. His holiness is unapproachable. And no sinful being could even dare to draw near to God apart from the grace that is in Christ uh, Jesus, okay? Uh, just like none of us would dare to, you know, to put ourselves or anywhere near the sun, you know, or we would not dare to put a man on the sun. People dare to put a man on the moon, but not on the sun, okay? Because they know that we will be instantly consumed even if we are thousands of, millions of miles away from the sun, we would be consumed. You know, we can't even look at the sun with our naked eyes anywhere close or millions of miles because we would be blinded even if we try to do it for a split second. So, you know, God's glory, His holiness is so much even more brighter than the uh, sun and in all His splendor is even more brighter than the sun. Imagine, he who created the sun is even more glorious than the sun. We can't even look at the sun. We can't even look at uh, God. So, you know, um, and we can't even know and understand the sovereign, immortal God who lives in unapproachable holiness, who's an invisible God. Uh, and, you know, we could, we could not know him. But thanks be to God, we're able to know and understand the glory, the nature of God, the characteristics of God, because God chose to reveal himself to us in the man, Jesus Christ. Okay. And then he says, to whom be honor and everlasting power. So he's telling Timothy, no, once you know who this Jesus is, it should bring forth a response okay not a response of what can he do for me you know can he has the power to crush down our enemies to defeat our enemies like goliath put them down you know but a response of simple and just profound worship you know just declaring honor and everlasting power towards this great god so i hope this whole uh, uh, reality of who God is and who he is revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ would give us this assurance of uh, fighting the good fight, also for looking at things with an eternal perspective um, and also, you know, to uh, lead us to worship and honor uh, him, okay? So Paul is praising the glory of God, the honor of this exalted God who is enthroned, uh, who is the Lord Jesus Christ and who alone is immortal, um, you know, and who lives in unapproachable light. Okay. Then he ends, uh, so we can read verses, uh, uh, okay, we read 17 to, we read verses 17, right? 17, 18, 19. Okay, no? Okay, can somebody read verses 17 to 21, please? Yeah, go ahead. Who command those who are rich yes. in this present. I continue, Pastor. Yes, please, Lobega. Command those who are rich in this present age not to, to be hasty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they, they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Sorry, Lubega, we lost you. Pastor. We lost you from verse 19. Can you read, please? Towering up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. O Timothy, God, what was commi commi committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and vain babbling and contradictions of what is false, falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith Grace be with you. Amen. 
Thank you, Lubega. So he's now talking about those who are rich. He says, you know, those who are rich, uh, they must use their riches responsibly. You know, uh, if they want to continue to be rich in the eternal life, you know, in the age to come, they need to know how to use their riches. He tells them not to be haughty. Um, so pride is a constant danger with riches. You know, we can, those who are rich can become very proud. And uh, um, it's easy for them to believe that they have more because, um, you know, they may in some sense be more godly than others or more better off or more blessed by God. Um, or, you know, they can, it's easy for them to believe that they are, they are more uh, rich because, you know, they have more than any other man or any other person. And so he's telling them, you know, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living uh, God. So we already spoken about this, that riches, you know, are temporary. Um, it's not eternal. Uh, it can, it can, we can lose riches like this. We can overnight come from uh, being, uh, uh, you know, from uh, being, uh, you know, we can be become come from a place to being uh, rags to riches and riches to rags as well, uh, from a place of having plenty of to a place where we lose everything overnight. So don't trust in riches. Um, and he says, you know, guard against this danger because uh, he's saying he wants us to trust uh, not in riches that are uncertain, but in God. Okay. And then he says, let them do good that they may be rich in good works ready to uh, give. Okay. So he's saying those who are rich should be willing to give, to do good uh, with all the resources, the riches that God has blessed them. Uh, at the same time, you know, when they do it, they need to guard their hearts uh, from, uh, you know, doing it to get applause from men, but do it because they, they love the Lord. Also guard their hearts from materialism and trusting in uncertain riches. Okay. Uh, of course, God blesses his people and those who are believers with riches, but they have a responsibility. Responsibility is to be good, uh, to be generous, knowing that even as they give away their temporary earthly wealth, they're laying up for them riches in heaven, laying up for themselves what is eternal. Okay. Um, and in Philippians chapter 4, verses 15 to 19, Paul informs the Philippians that, you know, what they have given to him, they've sent him an offering, you know, what they've given to him is like a sweet smelling offering before God, and that their reward, the fruit of what they have done will be credited in their account, and God himself will provide for all their needs. <coughs> Sorry. Then he says, lay hold on the eternal life. So Paul is basically saying, you know, uh, uh, leave the pursuit of money aside. Be content with what you have as a minister of God, you know, and uh, the vital thing is, important thing is to, you know, build on what is eternal and have an eternal perspective. Okay. And then he ends by saying this letter saying, God, what has been entrusted to you. Okay. He's saying, the truth, the gospel, which is the truth, the doctrines, which is the, the truth has been entrusted, has been committed to you as a pastor, as a believer, as a spiritual leader and overseer. And what you need to do is you need to guard it, you know, protect it because, um, you know, there's a lot of false teaching and some have strayed away from the, the faith. So he's telling Timothy, all that you need to do is, you know, keep this trust guard the truth and so it's so important for us in the day and age that we are living in but there's so much of false doctrines false teaching it's important that you know god has given us the scripture the truth and we are to guard it and protect it and teach the truth and preach the truth okay so he's saying guard that means keep a preserve watch over what has been given to you and avoid getting into things that are falsely called knowledge um, and, you know, we see that Paul is going to, the, the, the next letter that he's going to write to Timothy, he's going to write to him directly and specifically instructing him how to live as a man of God, uh, which we will start looking at uh, studying 2 Timothy next week. Okay. 
So that is uh, First Timothy chapter 6. Um, anyone has any questions, queries before we end class today? Okay, thank you all for joining class, for your patience, for enduring the last two hours of this class. And have a good, refreshing weekend. And I will post the assessment uh, for uh, uh, children's ministry this evening. Okay? Thank you, everyone.